Hey Danny, how you doing, man? Hello, Lewis. How are you? I am all right, thanks. It's oh. um, it's a. To be honest, I was going to say it's a lovely uh, Monday where we're recording this, but it's not. It's a grey, overcast Monday. We've had loads of like really nice sunshine, and yesterday it was like overcast and it became sunny. Now it's just gross. Well, it's really sunny up here. Oh, get you, Mister yeah, Sunny, with your sunny things. Yes, sunny bastard. <laughs> you sunny fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sunny fuck. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. Shall I? Shall I spin the wheel? The 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 fabled wheel. Oh, go on then. Treat yeah. yourself to a wheel-based spin. Right. Okay. Beep. 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 Oh. Oh. What? Oh, what's what's that? What's what's that? All that racket? Beep, beep, oh Jesus Christ! Beep. Oh no! Oh no! Oh sorry, sorry. I'm in, I'm being interrupted by all the birthday <laughs> messages that are flocking in. Oh, oh beep, happy beep, birthday, Dan! Beep 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 beep. Louis, I can't. Oh, it's so embarrassing. You're drowning under a tsunami of birthday oh, wishes. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> when you try and record a podcast and something as embarrassing as that happens <laughs> <laughs> oh well well happy well, birthday either way cocker are you having a lovely day are you doing nothing special in lockdown lockdown birthday celebration oh i'm gonna i'm gonna drink myself uh, to death um oh lovely mm. yeah yep so uh I got me good presents I haven't seen yet because I went to I, went, I said to, I went downstairs and said to my mum I was like mum I'm not being rude or anything and I love you very much but I'm recording a podcast now okay so I'll I'll, I'll deal with this when I'm when I'm down and about I like an hour the and three that you minutes were just furious about it like right I'll deal with this when I come back fucking hell <laughs> you're not allowed to love me at the moment okay I'll be back soon. <laughs> Yeah. Hold off on the love and affection. <laughs> you can love me soon, but not now. I mean, it, it totally wasn't the case that I'd forgot to do something for the bullshit and then remembered it was my birthday and I was like, <laughs> oh, hey, we'll just do that. <laughs> oh, you hear that plane? Lovely. Thanks, guys. That's, oh, that's yeah. That was hired for me. It's got a big uh, sign <laughs> waving out the back saying happy, happy birthday. birthday, Dan. They could only afford yep. Dan. They couldn't afford the final two letters. Oh, yeah, so come like, on. Happy birthday, Dan. Exactly. You've got to, you've got to make savings somewhere, don't you? Um. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it's a wonder they didn't just go hap birth Dan. Hap hap birth. birth duh, duh. So Lewis, would yes? Would would you would you get me? Eh? Would you? Um, I got you. This. You ready for this? Go on. Go on. You're an excellent podcasting co-host. Wow. There we go. See. Mark what a you. lovely present. I've Heart- even gift wrapped that for you. Heartfelt and fucking cheap, just like you, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that'd be funny if it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, but that's that's. I mean, it's not much bullshit when you think about it. It's just the day the day that you were born. I don't understand why people celebrate their birthday. Well, the thing is, when you really step take a step back, it becomes a okay. Well, I'm celebrating my birthday. It's either because I've celebrate because I've survived for yeah, another year exactly. because a mountain lion hasn't killed me, or it's because like, oh yeah, I'm celebrating another year on the planet because of what I could do in the future, but I don't know because yeah. I might die. Either yeah. way, it's a bit deathy. Or I, or I might become a, a complete and utter arsehole, and you've been <laughs> celebrating my birthday for years in in vain, for not. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna beat the odds and I'm just gonna turn out uh, this horrible, miserable old man like fuck it, fuck off. You'll turn into just, Daniel just... Plainview. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. I eat my birthday cake. See what I did there? See, what, see how I, I do? Yes, that, that was round? masterful. Yes. I couldn't nah. be more impressed to be perfectly honest. Course not. Course not. <laughs> So um, how's how's the lockdown affecting you so far? Because we are we are still locked down in the UK. I don't know how much longer we're going to be locked down, but we're locked down at the minute. Uh, has it driven you to do anything dull or anything you've been putting off for a long time? No, um, I mean, I, I don't really notice any difference to be honest. Because I'm always in lockdown. I'm always in my room <laughs> doing doing fuck all to help humanity. <laughs> So not much, not much has changed for me on on yeah, that of course, front. Of 
um, at the risk of being a bit controversial, right? Mm-hmm. And we have to talk about the disinfectant. Oh, good grief. Did you hear about that? <sighs> yeah, didn't I you thought... say with, with, with medical supervision, why don't you just inject yourself with disinfectant? I mean, yeah. good grief. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we always put a disclaimer out for politics in this show, but it's... it's what? He, yeah, he yeah. actually advocated putting disinfectant into your system. So much so that Dettol and Lysol had to come out and say, please <laughs> do not inject <laughs> products into your system. And we would just like to reiterate, please do yeah. not put <laughs> if you are listening to this podcast on YouTube or Podomatic or whatever, do not put bleach into your system. Just, just don't. Yeah. Bleaches for cleaning toilets and sinks, and that's it. Don't try and let it clean coronavirus out of your system, because that's just a poor idea. On I'm, all fronts. I'm a boring old centrist, but I think I can make a political stand on, on the <laughs> refusal to put disinfectant <laughs> to my system. You know we're in a very oh. strange political landscape when saying don't inject bleach is a political statement. It's yeah. what a bizarre... Oh, God. <sighs> I, I remember seeing um, it was literally the two headlines came up on my phone sort of overnight because of like our time zone, and it was um, Trump advises um, injecting disinfectant uh, to prevent coronavirus or whatever it was, and then literally below that was Australian health minister says do not inject disinfectant. And I was like, well, at least he knows what he's talking about. It's, oh, it's just crazy. Who do we? Who do we believe? <laughs> <laughs> Who, who do I do? Who do I follow? Whose advice do I follow? Um, what was the other thing he said about ultraviolet light? It was eat some light or something bizarre like that. Why don't you try eating some light? Um, we can uh, we can hit the bar we can hit the body with some with ultraviolet light. I know you I know you haven't done that, but I hear you're going to test it. It sounds it sounds very interesting. What the what the fuck are you talking about? You you <laughs> mental patient. Oh, it's ridiculous. Absolute I think it's like um, bedlam. every single second of his life is just like filibustering his way out of a lie. It's it's just increasingly ridiculous yeah. things that he's like, okay, if I just stand here and carry on talking, eventually I'll circle back to something that makes sense. <laughs> and then, then, then he sticks on that for a while. Where people in the audience go, yeah, all right, fine. I suppose drinking water is good. <laughs> then he's like, yes, now I can leave. <laughs> oh, good God. <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know what he said in response to criticism over it? He said he was speaking he sarcastically was being, or something. Yeah. Oh, I was. Uh, I was being sarcastic. Obviously, C- could you not tell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could you not tell from my I sarcastic mean, inflection? Oh fucking hell! Well, I mean, I, what's that I, line from? I, I, had I think to get it's that the set, an old episode of The Simpsons. It's um. That, that Homer somehow they have like a British butler for a short while, and Homer says to them, has to, says to the butler, "I hope you're not going to make fun of us with your dry British wit." And the butler goes, "Of course not, sir. I would never dream of doing such a thing." And Homer goes, "Good." <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it feels like that, and it just makes yeah. me smile. Oh, yeah, that's good. Gr- that's quite clever. Wow. I mean, I mean, that's that that happened. What else? What else has happened? Uh, um, I, I, I tell you what has happened. I think the Go entire on. world has got a sourdough starter now. Literally everybody in the universe has said to themselves, right, now is the time where I'm going to go to Tesco and I'm going to buy an enormous sack of flour the size of my torso and I am going to make a sourdough starter to make bread with. Okay, hon, whatever you say. Well, I've, I, I haven't done that. I must be the only one that hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I've got one. Again, I... Again, He's called Dimitri, my sourdough starter. The what? He's called Dimitri, my sourdough starter. Because he's kind of a bit alive, so I thought I should give him a name. So, Dimitri is, is what is I went with. The bi- the the bread is that disgusting that it's come alive and gained <laughs> sen- sentience. Well, it's that thing about yeast. I remember years and years... Like, I was going to say years ago. When we were talking on the podcast about yeast, and you were like, Ye- Yeast? Where, why, where do you buy yeast from? There is just yeast everywhere. So it's like wild yeast that you tame and <laughs> put into bread. God, I was a, I was a, I was a different person back then. Um, <laughs> Didn't know about wild yeast. 
Oh yeah, you know after after wild yeast was was introduced to me, I, I, <laughs> my my life changed for the better. <laughs> Your lifestyle changed enormously when... after after the introduction of wild yeast. Yep. Instead of hunting the English, I now hunt <laughs> wild yeast. <laughs> Come here, you sassanac! Oh, there's a yeast over there. Go, oh, let's go, boys. For clan the care. Yeast over there. <laughs> The, I love that idea. For the like twelve going Scottish clans, yeast, taking like a, a spear yep. and trying to skewer a yeast. I guess a yeast on the funny. apple and just like throwing a spear, skewering the apple perfectly. <laughs> oh no, he got away. <laughs> oh, he's a slippery wee thing. Aye. <laughs> oh, the real question is, how many episodes of this podcast can I manage to slip yeast chat in without without it really being very obvious? Like, if I just turned around and said, okay, now let's talk about yeast, that'd be a bit weird, but how many how many episodes of the it's podcast either... do you reckon I could slip in some yeast? Well, it's either it's either pasta or yeast, so... Yeah, yeah. Maybe I've got a... So, I mean, it's so, not... Is it that line from Brooklyn Nine-Nine? They're talking about how Teddy is, like, this really boring guy, and um, he says, all he wants to do is make and bottle pilsners, and he says, yes, that man is obsessed with yeast. Maybe that's me, maybe I'm obsessed with yeast. <laughs> Maybe you are. Maybe you are. I mean, there's, there's, there's worse things to be obsessed with, I guess. Um, well, yeah, I suppose. Unless your yeast-based <laughs> obsession becomes, like, murderous in some way. I don't know how you'd make that happen. Yeah, unless, unless you, like, freeze a yeast and go about stabbing people. <laughs> like, like, you know, in the Yogs... I'm pretty sure freezing the yeast Yogs doesn't cast, kill it, I don't know. In, in the Yogs cast, they, they talk... <laughs> When they're playing murder in G mod, they keep talking about what's referred to as a shagger, which is a, oh, a frozen God, yeah. shit dagger. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> that came from, I think it was an pull. episode of the, the Hat Films podcast. They were saying that somebody made a dagger out of their own shit. Like, All right, okay. <laughs> oh God, how ridiculous! Was it was it Ross that did that? I think it Ross was. Likes yeah. To, Ross likes to tell people to eat shit, doesn't he? He does, yes. I've stopped watching Hat Films videos, eat actually. Shit! They've probably released loads of stuff that I just haven't even... That I'm just completely unaware of. I know, I haven't I haven't watched uh, any of the Yogs casters in general for, for a wee while yeah. now. But, um, I tell you what, though. I should definitely I have get back watching. into them. I tell you what I've been watching is... You know Bon Appetit, that this cooking YouTube channel? And they have these, like, a, a couple of different shows. Like, one of them is Gourmet Makes. And it's this pastry chef that tries to, like, make a gourmet yeah. version of, like, something very pedestrian. Like, Mentos. Uh -huh. or, or Starburst. Or whatever it might be. And the other one is a show called wow. It's Alive. And I like that. It's like, it's alive. And he's making, like, bread. And he's fermenting, like, garlic and stuff like that. This garlic is a little bit alive. I'm just going to put it on my toast. Yeah, I like that. It's cool. So, let, let the creature from Frankenstein... It's, it's yes, a parody of that, like I guess. That. Wow. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds a bit weird. <laughs> you know, we get a lot of YouTube chat on this podcast, don't we? Like, comparing it we, to the other things, I mean, that's, a lot of the bullshits comprise YouTube. That is my only frame of reference. I know nothing else in society. I don't, I don't know anything. <laughs> Terrestrial know television, what's that? <laughs> You know exclusively, Sky you know exclusively Plus. of YouTube, but like nothing that's actually on YouTube? Because that would give you some like, yeah. cultural reference points. You're like, no, no, I refuse to watch the videos. I just like to click the buttons. Yeah. And it's and even if I do watch YouTube, it's only my niche little weird market of, of videos <laughs> that I peruse. I don't, I don't look at trending or, I, or, or, or subscribe to Logan Face or KS Psy or whatever, whatever they're fucking right. names are these <laughs> these massive multi-million dollar instagram teenagers that go on about fucking fighting each other for two years and <laughs> oh, the first God, one's a draw was and that? They, that was so weird the first one was a draw and <laughs> then they did it again and it's a, it's almost as if they made it a draw so that they could milk as much money out of their stupid fans as possible. Well, they, they actually <laughs> tell them a bit started better. selling tickets for the second fight before the first fight was even over. It was only by a couple of minutes oh, or something. But, like, it was all just ready to go. Just like, okay, we need to was. make this happen. Yeah, yeah. 
it's what got me about like this this YouTube hive mind culture was when was it Kylie Jenner? People started donating to Kylie Jenner to make her the youngest female billionaire ever, or the youngest billionaire ever, or something. It's like, what? You are People willingly have donating your money to, to the goal of someone that wants to get a billion dollars. Oh, I don't. That I don't get that. If you keep your money, it's you'll weird. be slightly closer to yeah. a billion dollars. It's it's people have got weird priorities. I think, you know, Definitely. we've got to get her to a, we've got to get her to a billion dollars, <laughs> because she wants to. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want I want a billion dollars. Where's where's my GoFundMe? I mean, where's my where's my can PayPal? We, can we start a GoFundMe <laughs> to give to give Danny a billion dollars, please? Can we start? Does GoFundMe even go up billion... to a billion dollars? I it, want. It... I want think not. to be a billionaire. <laughs> Make me one. <laughs> well, it's like that. Um, oh, I think it was like a joke book that somebody released on Amazon. It was like an ebook where they said, um, or no, it might have even been a paper book. They said how to make two hundred thousand dollars a year selling books, and then it was just this one book that cost two hundred thousand dollars. Like, how I made two hundred thousand I mean, yeah. dollars selling a book by selling it to you. <clears throat> say say right here's a here's a hypothetical right so say you had a book right that was that costed two hundred thousand dollars and a man with a gun said look if you don't sell this in a year i'm gonna kill everyone you know right what, how, how, what would your what would your sales strategy be what would you do i would put it up for auction how, because uh, and who would i think i would i would publicize it well i mean it depends what it is if it's something that's well known to cost a large amount of money, like Action Comics number one, first appearance of Superman, the one that Nick Cage like bought and sold a million times over, or or it's like a a first print okay, edition well, of Alice in Wonderland or something. Do you know what I mean? I'll tell you what it is, right? And this right. will make it even harder. It is the it is the it is the novelization of the film The Human Centipede. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have to sell the book. It doesn't matter how I do that. It doesn't matter how you do it. You have to sell it. Well, in that case, I would just say to it. my wife, "Can you I can't... just can I, do you, can can you give me a penny for this book, please?" And then we would just no. Swap it has the to. Thing. You have to sell it for two hundred thousand pounds. Oh, okay, right. You have to sell it for two hundred thousand pounds. I the novelization. <laughs> <laughs> the novelization of the Human Centipede. <laughs> the only way I think to get two hundred thousand pounds out of something that is definitely not worth two hundred thousand pounds is to create some kind of artificial scarcity. Say this is the yeah. only existing copy of this book written by. I mean, I mean, provided it doesn't matter if I defraud people of money. That it's like this is the only surviving notes of Leonardo da Vinci, and they just happen to be in this paperback copy of um, the, of, of, the of the novelization <laughs> of the Human Centipede. But like after he was maybe, after he was done. After he was done with the airplane, that's what he was moving on to next. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I reckon you'd have to create artificial scarc- scarcity, make it go viral. Yeah, that's the angle you have to sort of come at it from. I think. Yeah, I'm sure some. I'm sure. I'm sure some fucker would buy it. <laughs> if they can make Kylie Jenner a a, a billionaire, they'll <laughs> definitely buy your shitty little novel. <laughs> it's Kylie Jenner. Quite that literally. Buy it. She would buy it. She would buy it. She'd be like, oh my god, it's like so out there. And she would like buy it and then totally duped. Do you know, you could become like the next uh, Sha- uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, did you ever okay. Did you ever see him? Did you ever see him? Uh, oh, what, what was it? Uh, <laughs> Who is America? Did you ever see that show? Um, I didn't actually. No, I remember seeing it come on, but I didn't actually carve out the time to see it. It was so. It, it, it tricked these people into like doing like really embarrassing things. Like, like yeah. Political people. There, there was this uh, model who was like uh, promoting uh, oh, what, like handkerchiefs for, for people living in the third world and stuff like that. Right. Just like just like literally the smallest handker- handkerchief you could you could find, and she was like promoting it, and she'd been tricked into promoting it. And this was actually in the show, and it's it's really hard to explain. But he got these like, like these public figures to sure sure promote something, and he, and he was pretending to be someone else. 
So I, I don't know how it works legally, but it was it was fucking funny to watch. Tell you that. Well, there That's we you. there we go. You, That's you me. I need to get like Ky- someone. Kylie to... Jenner. <laughs> I need to get Kylie Jenner to promote the novelization of the Human Centipede, and thereby making yep. it worth two hundred thousand dollars. That's it. You've done it. Well, now we now we know. <laughs> the great, the greatest feat in human history pulled off by Lewis Brindley. <laughs> I've never even watched the Human Centipede. You know, I, I mean, I I feel like I don't oh. want to. No, I'm I feel like disgusting. I would just be scarred by it. Is is it is it, is it, it is. in any way good? No, it's or is it just, does it just exist to be film. shocking and horrible? Yeah, it's 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 the it's just shock horror to be honest. Uh, okay, yeah. It doesn't it do, it makes no sense whatsoever, <laughs> and it's just really disgusting. So sure, I, would, sure. I wouldn't recommend it. And we're reviewing it next week, now. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Well, speaking of films, uh, what is it we're reviewing this week, Daniel Kerr? Uh, we are reviewing a film called The Thing. We are. And it's the a, old it's school a great, one? It's a, yeah, the old school one. And it was directed by John Carpenter. It mm-hmm. was written by Bill Lancaster. Can't confirm. Um, it, was based on a, it was based on a novel. I can't Couldn't remember agree who more. wrote the novel, though. I'm not sure, but uh, it did come up in the have, credits you... at the end. Let me have a look. Go on, vamp for a bit while I have a look. Yeah, uh, and it's starring Kurt Russell, uh, Wilford Brimley, T. K. Carter, David, God, my handwriting's shite. David Clennon, <laughs> Keith David, <laughs> Richard Dyser, Charles Hallahan. So there you go. Well, the good news is I've just remembered what the thing is adapted from. It is a classic novella by John W. Campbell Jr. called "Who Goes There." Well, well there you go. The you, tagline you, you, is you, you, you. "Interplanetary Terror in the Antarctic." Not yes, especially catchy, I have to of, say. No, it really doesn't. Um, the thing is a bit better, I would say. Yeah, but, the um, ultimate anyway. in alien terror. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good like tagline. Yeah, but anyway, opening statements. <laughs> um, opening statements. One of the, f- one of the finest examples of cosmic horror I have ever seen. A terrifying and paranoid film that never lets you stop. Horror that isn't cheap or jump scarily even, or even ghoulish. It's the sheer horror of looking at something that you know nothing about and fail to understand. There we go. Um, a classic, that's in block caps, a classic cosmic horror which truly paved the way for a lot of sci-fi and horror going forwards. I couldn't agree more about the jump scares. Don't get me wrong, there are jump scares in this film but the horror of the film doesn't rely on that. There's a lot of, like, no. gross body horror, but the grossness isn't what makes it scary. It's how tortured the people look, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. all of the faces, and they look scared or, or, or in pain or, or whatever. That's what makes it horrifying, not the grossness that's occurring. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. It's hot. Some of the... Some of the, some of the... I've got to say, the special effects in this film for the for the time that it was released is yeah. absolutely amazing, amazing. Because, but um, go on, sorry. Because the Terminator was released two years after this, the the nineteen eighty four Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton and all them. So in that film, what, they had to like put a rubber mask on Arnold Schwarzenegger's face so that they could do like fake surgery on his eye sort of thing and like compare yeah. that to this like with, don't get me wrong this. this is not I, I would expect something better than this today but not a lot yeah. better do you know what I mean no because there was no it wasn't like today you would just get CGI which is fine but this mm. is all like, like special effects and prosthetics and like that's it a looks, good point yeah it looks real if you, I watched, I watched the prequel to it, the thing in two thousand eleven, mm-hmm. and it was just miss, it was missing something. It was all CGI, and it was just missing that 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 real fleshy charm about it. If mm. you get what and I mean. I suppose mean. that's the sort of the appeal of um, like Mad Max Fury Road, which is not a film I particularly enjoyed, but the things yeah. that did stand out was that it was all practical. There was, I think I read somewhere or I saw somewhere there was only one 
sort of VFX CGI car crash type thing. But that one crash, when you watch the film back, it stands out as a CGI thing. Yeah. And you think, well, I mean, I guess that was good. But like the rest of it, you're like, yeah. wow, that's really impressive. And similarly, on this on this role of like CGI and stuff, when the, I think when the original Tron film came out, like obviously it was like cutting edge for CGI and all that sort of stuff, but it was never actually mm -hmm. like um, put up for any visual effects Oscars because um, no. at the time the Academy considered it cheating to use CGI or visual effects in a film. They just thought, nope, we're not gonna that that's cheating. We're not gonna put Tron up for any awards. It's just a film about the space or whatever. Yeah, the Academy have got a weird relationship with, with horror. There's not really a lot of... And sci-fi in general. Uh, like, everyone was surprised when Lord of the Rings was put up for yeah. Oscars because they, they, they normally just don't do that. They don't really put the sort of, you know, uh, niche films up like that. But, you know, some only if it's popular enough, they'll, they'll do yeah, something yeah. like that. Did this film win any Oscars? It must have done. I don't know, but it must have done. It's it's I, like a classic, or is it one of those things that's only like retroactively considered good? I don't. I, I, I certainly hope not. I mean, it is it's just fucking fantastic. Not even not even just the prosthetics, like the actual story, and and the the characters and and the the sort of feeling about it is like mm. it's just amazing. I, oh god, right, apparently it really didn't do well at, at the box office. Uh, the impact on Carpenter was immediate. He lost the job of directing the 1984 science fiction horror Firestarter because of the thing's poor performance. Mm. Wow. Uh, his previous success uh, gained him um, a multiple film contract at Universal. The studio opted to buy him out of it instead rather than have him actually do them. Um, in terms of accolades... The thing got some nominations. It got Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy and Horror Films for Best Horror Film, Best Special Effects, but it lost out to Poltergeist and E.T. Uh, the film was nominated in the Razzie Awards for Worst Musical Score. I quite liked the score. I thought it was quite good. Well, I thought, yeah, I thought it was pretty scary. Oh, fuck well. That's okay. really weird, isn't it? Loads of people didn't that like it. That is so weird. Mm. It's such a good bit. It's, I think it might be my favourite horror film of all yeah, time. yeah. To be honest, it so, might be mine so as well. He... Yeah. Oh, oh well, fuck him. Who needs him? Oh Who needs him? The thing is screened we'll annually it. at the a Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Right? <laughs> of all the wow, places must, I would want to watch this must... film, I would not want to watch it <laughs> at either of the poles. Let's be honest. That, that must fucking suck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Time to watch the thing again. No. Come on. No. no. We just Not dug again. up a mammoth out of the ice. I don't want to watch the thing. <laughs> Even after we found that spaceship. <laughs> this will give us anyway, some pointers, guys, on what we can do with that spaceship we found. <laughs> Here, let's watch the film and see what they do. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, so Dead. what we need um, to do is to make all these same facial expressions and to get killed by an alien. That's the goal. Is the, where, where is this? Where is this person from? This character Dudley. that you've, in, <laughs> you've Dudley. <laughs> They're one of the first um, Arctic researchers from Dudley. I don't. I don't know if that's I thought true. You were there might be a lot of Arctic researchers I, from Dudley. I thought you were slipping into Birmingham there. That might be even look funnier. <laughs> oh no! There's a there's an alien in the ice. <laughs> oh god! There's a well, spaceship. Should, <laughs> should we actually pretend to talk about the film for five seconds? They should remake it right and put oh, Ozzy Jesus. Osbourne as a as as McCready. As Kurt Russell, yeah. Replace Kurt Russell with Ozzy yeah. Osbourne. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Anyway, right. Let's actually talk about this. Okay. So. <laughs> Are dogs just the catalyst for hating a character or a monster? I think so, yeah. There's a website called uh, doesthedogdie.com or, do or does the dog survive or something like that. And basically you go on and you search for a film and it'll tell you if the dogs in the film die or survive so you know whether you want to yeah. watch it or not. Like, um, wow. I remember seeing one for like Scarface or something ridiculous. It was like, oh yeah, the dogs are fine. It's like, oh, all right, I'll watch that then. Don't mind. 
I mean, I, I, I'll watch it whether the dog dies or not, because the film is probably beyond the, the dog dying, you know. But I've got to say, see this film, it is the the, the most horrifying uh, depiction of dogs being killed I think I've ever seen. Yeah, it was so, horrible, wasn't not it? Only, not only do they get killed, they get absorbed. They get, it's, it's as if the, the, the very essence of them is getting sucked out. Mm. And dogs have just got dogs have just got this this inherent sense of knowing when something goes wrong. Mm. You know that way. Mm. And mm. Th- when they all start barking at this lone dog that's just sitting there and just c- convulsing, it's fucking horrifying. Mm-hmm. It's um, yeah, <laughs> you're completely right. If you if if a character kills a dog, then anything that people do to that character is is justified completely. It's like in John Wick. <laughs> the, you don't mind that John Wick kills about 80 people. Which is like, well, you know, they did kill a puppy. <laughs> you, 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 so you just don't care at puppy. that point. Yeah, it's like, fuck you. You're, you're dead, man. Hmm. I mean, it's... it's it, Because we know it's fake in films, it's that our moral uh, qualms get suspended for like an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 45 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's like, normally, if, if a puppy was killed, we probably wouldn't go on a killing spree that that left bodies in the in the in the sc- scores, you know. <laughs> We'd probably just call the police and be very upset. But no, it's like no, no, that's fine. John John can kill as many people as he as he has, as he has to. Um, I've got a question. Go on. What do you think these scientists were actually researching at Antarctica? Like, why were they? What were they doing? Because they seem to be just sat around, like playing with the jukebox. That's all they actually seem to be doing. Um, that's a good question. I don't actually, I don't actually know. Also, I I why does the chef said... or cook or whatever? Why does he feel the need to wear skates twenty four seven? Why, why is that a thing he feels the need to do? Because he's bored. It's the Arctic and it's cold. <laughs> there you go. Keeps him fit. <laughs> uh, would um, you like to know what my my favourite threat was from this film? Go on. I'm a real light sleeper. Okay. Are oh, you Kurt Russell? That's good to know, mate. It's it just really wow. made me laugh. It's like I wouldn't risk it. I'm a real light sleeper. It's that's the kind of threat you'd hear like Boyle say in Brooklyn Nine Nine or something. Yeah, every 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 sort of uh, cult horror film or cult uh, science fiction film in in the last century has like, a line that everyone remembers, <laughs> uh, like, mm. like uh, or in, in, in Terminator. Get away from her, you bitch! Or something like that. Or is it, it was stay aliens. away from her, you bitch? Yeah, aliens, that aliens, get away from her, you bitch. Yeah, Ripley was in the oh, no. big robot thing. What was it, get away? Was it get away from me if you want to live? Come with me if you want to live. No. That's, that's the line from Terminator. Oh. Fuck off. Right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? There's always a, mm. a cheesy line that everyone remembers. I can't believe yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got one. Okay, this, this will, this will test you. Okay. What is ET's famous line? Uh, we've had this conversation before. Isn't it home phone or something? Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says it the wrong way around. Yeah, I've never what actually is... watched ET. You haven't watched ET. Don't act like wow. that's some kind of crime against God. No. Wow. No, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, it's an okay film. But <laughs> you should watch You should watch the, the audition tape for, for one of the wee boys in it. It's like, actually, his acting is very good. But anyway, mm. back to the thing. Um, <laughs> it's it, As great as this film is, it's a pure sausage fest, isn't it? So like just um, Yes, a little the, bit. The, the, the prequel had... Um, had oh what's her name? She's in a uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the wor- the world. Okay, uh, I'm just going to Google that really quickly, Dan. Uh, M- the thing turns M- into Mary Mary Elizabeth Winstead or something like that. Yeah, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. That's what Google that says yeah. anyway. She was in the she was in the prequel. Uh, mm-hmm. To sort of obviously because I mean why why wouldn't there be a a female at the research facility but it is it's a, it is a bit of a sausage fest oh no you film. forget Danny this was the 80s when women couldn't do science come on I, I know I, for, I keep forgetting fuck <laughs> oh god no you're right it is a bit weird this lack of 
lack of representation that is is easily defensible. So like, well, they just happened not to be. It's like, yeah, but come yeah, on, really? you have you you make the choice there. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, exactly. Mm. So everyone has the 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 choice. Everyone chooses their intergalactic dream team. And on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we have decided that this is a new segment because we absolutely love it. We even came up with um, with some rules last time because I have no idea why. But, you ready for the rules, everyone? Um, you can only have two non-humans in your team of five. You can't have yeah. God because that's... <laughs> Or, any, or or a, I, I think if you have like oh yes I want a god on my team and he just defeats everyone okay um, uh, your plan has to have details and it has to be defensible against nitpickery so if Danny's like oh well yeah he just like appears down there and kills him I have to be able to say yeah but how does he get down there does he use a ladder does he use a jetpack what if he's what if his arm falls off what if um, and it must be an in very strong inverted commas doable because we. <laughs> We know it's sci-fi, but come on now. <laughs> it has to be doable in a sci-fi <laughs> sense. Oh shit. What's up with you? I've noticed a pro I've noticed a problem already. <laughs> right. <laughs> my team. I-, I I forgot the rule that you're only allowed uh, two non humans. <laughs> but I'll I'll and you, well, you can score me down for that, but I'll I'll read I'll read <laughs> okay. what I've got. Uh, okay, so so to lead the team, I have Ozymandias. Better known as well, okay. not really better known. Uh, Adrian Veidt from Watchmen. Um, yeah. Number two, I have R two D two. Right. Number three, I have I G eight eight, who is another Star Wars droid. Uh, okay. Number so four, R two D two. Who was the other one? I G eight eight. I mean, I've never watched any Star Wars. This seems. I, I can't imagine it's R2-D2 different. and IG-88 are very different. Oh, IG-88 is, is pretty tall, and he's, and he's oh, good with well. There you go, then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go on, who's number your, four who's your fourth? Number four is Data. <laughs> Jesus. Right. Um, I see you're going for a robot-heavy n- team. Yeah, and number five is a Xenomorph. Okay. A, a, a classic alien xen- xenomorph, or yeah. Okay, so there we go. You've got Ozymandias from Watchmen, R two D two and IG eighty eight from Star Wars, Data from TNG, yep. and a xenomorph from the Alien franchise. That's it. Who's the yep. big bad? And a, a Dalek. A Dalek. One individual Dalek. Okay, I can't well, help but well, feel I mean... that the xenomorph could probably do this on its own. <laughs> The Dalek, the Dalek from from the 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 episode Dalek, oh, okay, killed yeah, two hundred people single hand, like that that killed two hundred people single handedly. Like, I mean a Dalek that doesn't just sort of wobble about and go. I'm I'm talking about an actual, if if taken to its logical conclusion, mm-hmm. a, an incredibly intelligent battle tank that's almost okay. indestructible. You want a Dalek, Dalek. The intellect of. Yeah, a Dalek, Dalek. Okay, okay. And uh, and the ship I'm using is a Voyager. Voyager, the what, what do they call them? It's it's they call them SS sta- sailing ship or starship or USS Enterprise, yeah, the Star- SS Enterprise, Starship Enterprise. That's it. Yeah. I think... Okay, Starship Voyager. Yep. Okay. Is it not? Is it not United Starships? USS. So that again, Cocker. United Starship Enterprise or something like that, because they're part of the Federation, aren't they? Hello. You there, mate? Hello. Hello. Yeah, I've just got you back, Dan. You're right. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, okay, let's pick up where we left off then, eh? Um, so you've got the Starship Voyager. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, w- w- what's the battleground? Is the Dalek just like floating in space, so the Voyager can just like rock up in front of him? No, it's in a, uh, it's in a, it's in a, uh, a Borg cube. Okay. <laughs> okay. The Dalek is in a Borg cube. Okay. Yep. Okay. So here's here's the plan, right? Right. Okay, so 
before I approach the Borg cube, I take Ozymandias and the Xenomorph into a shuttle, and I and I transport them away, right? And uh, right. Uh, the the Voyager gets closer and closer, and it's within range of the of the Borg ship, and the Dalek will know that there's no life forms on board. Oh, God. Right. Okay. And um, <laughs> but what I'll then do is, I'll transmat the Xenomorph from the shuttle onto the ship. Right. And then it'll be like, oh, a life form, and I'm a massive genocidal racist, so I better go over there and kill it. And send it over. So, but hang on, hang on, hang on. How could... Why wouldn't the Dalek be able to detect, detect the life forms in the shuttle? Because it's out of range. Okay. How are you going to stop the... Um, but then, if it's out of range, a shuttle wouldn't have, like, a long-range transporter. No, but the sh- no, but Voyager would. Yeah, Voyager would, but Voyager's shuttle <laughs> would not. Yeah, but it can... St- Voyager can still transmat from uh, the shuttle to the ship oh okay I see what you're saying so Voyager is like a midpoint okay yeah, yeah so, Okay. So data, I'll let you have that one Data and the, the other robots would transmat the Xenomorph onto the ship the Dalek would go <laughs> fascist crazy and then start attacking the ship and mm-hmm. uh, then my shuttle would sneak up <laughs> would, would, would sneak up uh, uh, behind it and, uh, okay. and, and and bored without it knowing because it's so raging. <laughs> <laughs> You're relying on the stupidity of a, of a racist Dalek here, which is, I feel that's not a good, it's a reliable battle plan, but it's not a good battle plan. Yeah, but he doesn't, he doesn't know, does he? Because he's too busy focused on this sh- one ship and he's, and he's piloting a Borg cube, which is normally piloted by thousands and thousands of other uh, uh, drones. Okay, yeah, but the the Daleks do have a hive mind. Oh, that's so... bollocks. That's no, they do. That's Stephen Genuinely. Moffat bullshit. That you can't do that. They okay, never. They... Nobody hates Stephen Moffat as much as me. They ne- but they never the Daleks ha- do have a hive mind. He's used to the concept of a hive mind. No, they never have a. They never had a hive mind before Stephen Moffat joined. They never okay, had fine. one. We'll say they haven't got the Moffat hive mind. Yeah. It was Stephen. He's like, oh yeah, they have a they have a telepathic web. They have the path web thing. Uh, yeah, and Clara's like, oh, I'm the only one that can hack it. <laughs> Fuck off. Um. So yeah, they, it doesn't have a hive mind. It's on its own. Right. And uh, and it's racist and it <laughs> really hates the fact that this life form is alive. And then o- okay. Ozymandias uh, sneaks onto the ship and and is like traversing the the, the long metal corridors. And then mm-hmm. uh, hits uh, f- 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 it's somewhere in there. Finds the self destruct button for the Borg <laughs> cube, and uh, bold of you to assume that the Borg cube would have buttons, because if the Borg are controlling it via hive mind, then they're kind of they're like jacked in. Do you know what I mean? That like well, if the, the Dalek next, can not control it, but if the Dalek can control it, then Ozymandias can control it. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure how I feel about that one, but go on. Okay, so, yeah, he blows up uh, the, the thing, and Ozymandias dies, and the Dalek, if it's not dead, it'll be incredibly damaged, and its, okay. its weapons will be destroyed, and then I'll I'll, I'll bring it aboard uh, Voyager, and then uh, IG-88 will shoot it in the head, and then the Xenomorph will uh, do that wee mini eye mini sort of mouth thing and go <laughs> and kill the the mutant inside and there you go have one there you go well now i now i know there's a couple of assumptions you made like ozymandias would be able to operate the borg ship which i'm not sure i'm i'm not sure he would why because he is from the 80s uh-huh. which is like as much as he's the smartest man in the world it's like it's like giving an ape a pencil it could make shapes, but it couldn't generate the concept of language and then write it. Do you know what I mean? It's just too advanced, I, I think. I'm sorry. He teleported a fucking mutant that he created into New York, killing millions okay. of people. He he has he has an he has an Antarctic base that he built like, almost single handed. Like he's he's so intelligent, and you think that if it, it was on Voyager and he couldn't find the schematics of a Borg ship and work out how to pilot it? No. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't think that 
Yeah, okay. So he would have prep time, which is sort of Ozymandias' yeah. greatest weapon is prep time, <laughs> which says a lot about him. But, like, <laughs> yeah, okay. If he's got prep time and he's got, like, Borg ship schematics and, yeah, okay. Yeah. And if we're presuming that he understands the concept of, like, warp drive and stuff. <laughs> It'd be briefed and all that. By data. By data. Yeah, good old data, eh? Good old data. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. Good old data. Yeah. I don't even know. Well, I don't even know why I chose Ozymandias because it could have just been anyone. Yeah. Literally, could have just been anyone. Yeah, you, you could have picked like John McClane. I could have. Like, yep. I could. John McClane teleports onto the Borg ship and then self destructs it. John McClane seems more self sacrificey than Ozymandias does, to be honest. I know, but Ozymandias would do that if he had to. Yeah, yeah, okay. He he might do it if he was if he was sort of forced to in a way. Yeah. Okay. Well, Fine. Thank you. And there is the end of the intergalactic dream team uh s- section, which I quite like it. I th- I quite like it. It's your turn next week, isn't it, Lewis? It is my turn next week. I'll have to give it some rigorous thought. Yeah, you better. You better do. <laughs> um. Anyway, okay, back. I have a, back to the I have thing. A question about the thing. <laughs> um. Are horror movies lazy for relying on jump scares to make their film scary? Yes. Next. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I agree, but, you know. Okay, next. Um, why would you explode the thing? When Kurt Russell, at one point or another, he kills one of them, or he disables it for a period of time, and then he explodes it. Uh-huh. Why would you explode it? Because it, yeah. the entire point is that it's like a contagion, and that one cell can convert an entire body. Yeah. So, surely exploding it is just distributing tiny particles of of thing everywhere. Yeah, I agree. It's, that was a that was a dumb move. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Hit me. How many creatures have the has the thing absorbed? Well, that's another good point because we we don't know what the universe was like a hundred thousand years ago. Were there aliens? I mean, obviously there were because there's the thing. But did it? Is it just going from planet to planet, assimilating species like the Borg? Yeah, because it's not. That's not the thing's ship. Okay. That's that's an alien ship that it that the thing has infiltrated. So, oh, okay. So this thing has has possibly it could have millions upon millions of species in its arsenal, and mm. and it's like the bigger it is, the more intelligent it is. So, like, if it's the size of a human being, it's probably got it's got all the combined intellect of um mm. of of all the creatures that it's ever absorbed. Which I suppose it could be like a, a a cumulative intellect based thing. So it's like if you're a human, you have everything of human intelligence and below, yeah. or everything of the, of the intelligence that fits in a human sized sort of parcel. Everything there and below. Yeah, which is pretty fucking scary when you think about it. It is super scary because it means like it, you just it, uh, you end up generating things that's like well we have no way to combat this because we have no way of even knowing what it is yeah <laughs> like like the way that human beings this is one of my great problems with Star Trek is the way that anything j- like knows the 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 the, uh, the way that anything qualifies the amount of damage that a weapon can inflict is by knowing what it could do to its own species. Yeah. Like, we know that a bullet or whatever is is particularly bad because of the damage it can do to a human body. Mm-hmm. But what if we encountered Martians that have skin that just happens to be bulletproof? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, that's the thing that makes the thing scariest, is thinking, well, we don't know how strong it really is. We have no idea... It, like, everything... It could be completely invulnerable to every single one of our weapons just by chance yeah if it's assimilated a hundred million species oh yeah well it turns out that this one is bulletproof and fireproof and grenade proof and cold proof do you know what i mean it's yeah it's it's ridiculous i mean evidently it isn't in this instance because you know it would have used that if it if it could which begs the question are there other things out there are there other creatures like this that can absorb as much as possible, and just t- and take over the characteristics of anything that it that it comes into contact with. That I mean, is there an well, army maybe. of things? Is is there civilization, or is it just primarily a, just a a being that that is just trying to survive? 
like a, an animal. Well, that's the point at which it becomes hard to define because, like, it's it's sort of a hive mind type situation. Like, it's lots of very small creatures, even down to the size of one blood cell. Yeah, and it, it's like it could be a million billion creatures that make up something that resembles a man. So, how do, how do you? There's no way. I suppose there's no real way of knowing. But you'd think that if it got big enough, and it has all the combined uh, intellects of of everything that it killed, then it would 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 it would it have a sort of existential moment? Would it be like right? Well, maybe I should set up society. Maybe I should create my own place to yeah. live and, and breathe. Well, that's the question. It's like um, like a human's end goal in any situation is sort of just to be comfortable. Yeah. It's like well, once you've made sure that nobody's trying to kill you, it's like well. Suppose I kind of want food and water. Yep. So <laughs> by assimilating a human's capabilities of having five fingered hands or having eyes or whatever the human capability is, yep. does it also absorb the human wants and desires, but just ignores them? <laughs> yeah. No, nope, instead, I'm just going to exist in this frozen Antarctic research base forever. What What does it want? That's, the, that's another scary thing. What could the thing possibly want? I mean, it's just it's so, and it, what what would be even scarier is that maybe it, its wants are shaped by the things that it kills, Mm-mm. which is like it's it truly is just a, a a complete and utter interloper that it just it doesn't yeah. it doesn't just steal your life and your and and your essence and your identity it steals everything that you want as well. That could be even that that could be something that I wish they'd I wish they'd do another film. Or like a series about it, or something, because it's such mm. a cool idea, and such a horrific idea, and all we get is a fucking prequel that that's okay with some shitty CGI. It's like they should do, <laughs> they should really do something with it. I think it could be really, really good. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, what do you think the creature originally looked like? Oh, that's an interesting question. Because na- cause we don't know what it's what it's sort of standard default form is now. Yeah. Like, is it like Cronenberg, Rick and Morty, or is it, <laughs> what could it what could it possibly look like? I don't know because you'd have to presume just by evolution's sake. Well, it's got to have some method of like movement, so some kind of leg or tentacle or something. Yeah. And it's got to have some kind of way to detect the environment around it. Whether is it a sight-based creature? Is it a smell-based creature? Is it a sound-based creature? There's just no way to know. But the idea that it it com- it's completely, um, like it gets all of its assets from everything that it's absorbed is that was it was it just a cell floating around, mm. and then it just touched something and just started copying its DNA and just okay that's that that's that and then just built up this plethora of information and just use that yeah. and then just kept doing that and doing that and doing that until its original sort of floaty cell form was just unrecognisable and yeah, it was that's, that's even sort of scarier yeah it's fucking horrif- it's horrific oh gotcha god god I don't know what what I'd prefer if it was like a space dog or something with three heads and then oh yeah it can suddenly it has the ability to turn into a normal dog and a human and a seal and a polar bear and a, I don't know what's more scary if it's that or if it's just a bit of intergalactic bacteria that, yeah. that just became this sort of animalistic wants to kill and eat everything type type thing because the fact that the thing doesn't try to escape is what makes it all the more terrifying yeah. because if the thing tried to escape and tried to get to civilization and then got to I don't know the nearest city Svalbard or something and said oh hi I'm Gerald from the US research base can I have a cup of coffee please or whatever and he said like, you've driven 10 miles 10 hours in the snow it's like yep the, the, do you know what I mean if, if it got to a population centre then wouldn't it if it tried to get to a population centre then that's what makes it understandable is that it has a motivation but it just doesn't seem to have a motivation. It just exists in the world. Yeah. I, I, the, the, the only thing I can guess is that it's 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 there to eat and it's there to feed. Mm. And does it but does it need food? Does it need does it work in the same way? Because, you know, having different species as part of your 
your arsenal. Maybe some species don't need food in the same way that we do. So does that mm, mean it's that like it... how um maybe that's why it's in a cold place? It's like those frogs that can get frozen over the winter and then in the spring they thaw out and they're completely fine. They're like technically dead and frozen in the winter and then they thaw out in the spring and they're just completely fine, ready to go. So does the thing need like one calorie per decade yeah. or something? Or do, <laughs> because if you're if you're considering like a, a, a any kind of metabolic rate that we know of, you'd think well, growing is sort of one of the most calorific things you can do. That's why like yeah. kids and teenagers and stuff are so hungry, is because they are growing like a foot in a year or something ridiculous. Yeah. So do you think does the thing not need a lot of calories to make that happen? To, to, to transform from dog to Cronenberg nightmare with weird horrible tentacles what does it how does it work it feels it, it just feels as if everything that it is everything is based on what it absorbs which is like mm. before that it, maybe it didn't need it, it was like it was just a starving single celled organism yeah that, 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 that needed to copy something or needed needed to to, to absorb something and it's just in this ever hungry quest of just absorbing stuff but would it always need to be cold because i'm sure that there are species out there that require it to be warm would does it well, evolve yeah. in that way or, or is it just at that point is it just needing cold and or does yeah. it always it like need a, cold or a cold-blooded animal that requires to just sit in the sun for 10 hours before yeah. it can do anything like but, a lizard from the desert or whatever yeah I, but i don't know how it could be because if it absorbs things and becomes the things that it absorbs there are plenty of creatures out there that don't need that and require heat like a lot mm. of heat rather than than you know cold but then there are like excremophile bacteria that live like on thermal vents under the sea that love being 400 plus degrees or whatever insane thing i mean it's this is all entirely just conjecture we have no way to know for sure no it's but it's it's an, it's an interesting thing to think about like definitely is it essentially like a hive mind that's just lots of different because yeah because what once... if it's not one species of alien what if it's two or three different oh. kinds of space bacteria that have formed this hive mind and just as an emergent property of them being together is the fact that they can shapeshift. That's an interesting point. Because it seems to me that once it splits between the sort of main host, it's like the, the, the many things become their own animal and they think yeah. for themselves, are they still connected to the to Yeah, the main are host they somehow? like telepathic or something? We, yeah. Or or is that just a separate animal now that fends for itself and just, you know, is completely on the same mission as its as its uh, as its predecessor? Because it, as the the smaller it is, the less intelligent it is. Because that's why with the blood cell or the or the the blood it's like an animal that small couldn't have the presence of mind to think I better pretend that that didn't hurt me otherwise i'm gonna get found out because it's yeah it's brain is so small it's like all it can do is is defend itself which is why yeah it and works. it's like with um oh what's the other one when it, when it was like the spider head crab thing yeah and it just sort of it was it just sort of walked out of the room like a crab because it doesn't yeah it can't conceive of the idea of right i better be quick otherwise these lot will kill me yeah it, it doesn't have that object that that's that sort of idea no but then, does the thing ever exhibit like high, high levels of intelligence? Well, it can. It can pretend to be other people. That's that's true. Yeah, fairly, fairly well. It, it's 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 you know it's it's it, it'll stay quiet unless it's lit, unless it's lit, found out, and then it just breaks the the facade and just attacks like any other animal. It's lit, it's easy to look at it as this horrible you know alien monster thing but it is it, it, you know it feels as if the the film has like a background of like science based in it it's like it's like a, an, a another animal it's like mm. if it can stay out of harm's way it will and i love the yeah, idea yeah. that the bigger it gets the more able it's it's more able to comprehend it's it's danger it's like i better just pretend to be this person i think that's yeah i think that's terrifying so it's like if you you let it get bigger and it'll eventually be able to fucking outsmart you which is yeah yeah fucking scary <laughs> it, it is scary it's like oh what's that i mean we've talked a lot about star trek today somehow but 
is it the crystalline entity or something they yeah. call it? Yeah. And the, they, the, the, the Enterprise is just flying through space and they're like, oh, we've got this uh, funny signal off the off the port side or whatever. It's like, oh, that's weird. Go and have another look. And then it just, just it grows a bit and suddenly it's like, oh, that's kind of like a heartbeat or like brain waves or something. Yeah. And it grows a bit more and it's like, oh, it's trying to communicate. Then it grows a bit more and it becomes malicious and, oh. But it's like there's no way to stop it from growing. No. It's just going to become bigger and bigger and more and more intelligent and those are those are the those are the, the I think the most horrible iterations of aliens. Like these these massive masses of stuff that that's so beyond our understanding that it's not you know a humanoid race. It's like just completely and utterly alien, essentially. Mm. Because even things that are more alien, like the xenomorphs, where their their form is not defined by their DNA, it's defined by the host DNA. Yeah. Like, you look at the life cycle of an alien, and it's just insanity. It's like some kind of an idiot threw paint at a board and said, yep, that'll do, we'll, yeah. we'll have that sort of thing. It's, but it's, it's, like, it's, um, it's in an egg, and it, it, it's the form of this face hugger. It, it latches itself onto its prey, and then impregnates the host with this small creature and then it just bursts out and like within an hour it's like a full sized I would love to watch it grow let's see how it like like, because you don't see it grow in the film which is obviously because it wouldn't be scary but I'd love to see a xenomorph actually grow in in the Mm. span of Mm. an hour and and what that would look like I think it'd be fucking Mm. terrifying I know completely what you mean but like even that that completely different alien life cycle it's still is humanoid. not as scary as it is still humanoid but like i mean now we're getting into the the deep lore of the alien franchise but <laughs> yeah. i think the reason it's humanoid is because it like gestated in a human like if it gestated in a dog then it would be a different shape or if it gestated in a hamster i think so i think they actually say that in the films i think there's different aliens are different shapes for different reasons and stuff oh, yeah that well that make that makes it even more interesting mm. which is like um it's, it's a just, bit like the thing. It's just horrible. <laughs> it is a bit like the thing. I, I had this conversation the other day with somebody or other, and they were saying like, "Well, Alien and the Thing are actually very similar." It's like, yeah, I think what happens in the film is quite similar. Like one malicious alien entity kills all of the people in the film, basically. Who do you think would win? The 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 thing versus Alien. Yeah. The thing. Yeah, definitely. Hundred percent. Because it would like, just, I think it would just absorb it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like, oh, lovely. <laughs> Ooh, a nice little snack. A, z- a nice xenomorph <laughs> snack. <laughs> mm. But I think, um, not the message so much, but the thing is trying to, like, I think all sci-fi is a, kind of has a message to some extent. It, like, either it's Day of the Triffids type stuff, or it's like, um, yeah. like, I think, like Terminator, the message of Terminator is like, progress will always happen. You can't change the future. You yeah. just need to sort of accept life. And I think the message of, like, The Thing is... It's, it's about man's willingness to turn on himself. Yeah. And about, about how humans have an identity crisis with themselves and other people that should sort of identify with as humans. And I think the alien is, is less about that, more about the inevitability of, like, you never know what's going to happen next. Sort of yeah. thing. I think they are slightly different in their in their core meanings. But there's a there's a theme that runs through uh, both both films. Not 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 so much Terminator. It's like, but man is in, is is incredibly small. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's like we we are we are a single speck in a, in a universe that is absolutely massive. It's so huge that you can't even comprehend it. It's mm. it's infinite and ever expanding. And you know, to, to to even wrap your head around that is just is just mental. And Roger. we've got this we've got this sort of idea that we're somehow the center of everything. It's like no, we're not. We we are we are one planet in a tiny galaxy and a tiny cluster of galaxy. And it just goes on and on and on forever. It's like it's like mental. So of mm, course mm. there are going to be things out there that are much worse than we are. So the thing, the thing could be fucking uh, level one. I mean, that could be the first yeah. big boss. <laughs> then you explore a bit further, and it's like, oh, that's Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's Azathoth. Uh... <laughs> I've started reading some of the Lovecraft stuff. I got, um, I, I picked up this book off my bookshelf that was, um, it's like a graphic novel version of some classic 
um, Lovecraft short stories, yeah. it is really difficult to read because it's like old school prose that's just sort of imposed over these horrific images. You're yeah. like, well, this is just impossible to read. So I started reading it before bed because it's like, it's just so difficult to read that it beca- makes me sleepy. It's like, I would rather sleep than read this. So I should close it and then go to sleep. But um, yeah, the Lovecraft stuff of like, you have no idea what's behind the curtain sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, definitely. We have this limited understanding of the universe. We've got no idea what else there is out there. Just because we think we are the dominant life form, it could just be by happenstance yeah. that, 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 we, that we're clever enough to defeat a lion, which is like yeah. the next level up or so. Do you know what I mean? But then it could, if you look at, at the rest of the universe, it could be that everything else is the humans and we are the mice. Yeah, definitely. Or the ants even. Yeah, yeah, totally. And then we are the, the ice cream that the ants crawl all over. Or oh, something. Better Call Saul. Oh, yeah, go <laughs> listen to the other podcast. That's about Better Call Saul and the Samantha's doing stuff like that in there. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a good, good bit of shill in there. Um, <laughs> have you got a favourite? Have you got a favourite uh, uh, cosmic entity in Lovecraft yet? In Love, well, I've only read the one, which is Call of Cthulhu, so I've, I'd have to say Cthulhu. Right. My, my favourite's uh, Yog Sothoth. I am unfamiliar. Yog Sothoth is a uh, is said to be the most intelligent of the of the uh, outer gods okay uh, but and his his morals are like really weird it's like mm, he, mm. he's sort of locked out of the physical universe unless he's like summoned in some way yes i think i'm aware of this yeah there's um sorry i'm, I'm steamrolling right over you here but no no bother um, this, I didn't realise it was a Lovecraftian story being retold. I thought it was just a, a, an audio drama because I like listening to audio drama if I'm like baking or gardening or whatever. Um, and I am also an old man in a twenty-year-old's body. But um, yeah. this BBC Radio Four, it's like a podcasty thing where um, it's the case of Charles Dexter Ward yes. is, I think, a Lovecraft book or story, and I didn't know it was. So I just thought, oh, it's a it's a horror audio story it's a horror audio drama so i listened to the whole thing and i thought god that's really good and it's like this sort of modern retelling of that old school story and that is incredibly good and i think they had they involve yogsothoth in that or at least in the second series that's right but um if you daniel kerr like lovecraft or if you the listener like lovecraft i cannot recommend the whisperer in darkness enough that's what the the podcast feed is called the first series is the case of charles dexter ward the second series is The Whisperer in Darkness. It is so good. I can't recommend it enough. I will give it. I will give it a look. Um, mm. Love Lovecraft put forward the idea that that Yog Sothoth was um, uh, Yahweh at, at Mount Sinai. Oh, that, okay. That, that, that gave Moses the the Ten Commandments, just hmm. just because just because he could rather than <laughs> just that, because that he is, could rather than just you know rather than revealing some divine truth he just wrote a list of commandments and some stone tablets and just gave them to him mm. So and also Moses by the way mate while you're here every Thursday you need to be, like <laughs> throw a grape in the air and catch it in your mouth <laughs> that was just Yogg off fucking about so yeah. yep that last one just throw a grape in your mouth yeah every Thursday yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I love the, the sort of descriptions of the of the of the, the cosmic entities like Cthulhu is like more humanoid than any of them Mm. You know, he's got a squid face and all that, and like, but he still has arms and, and arms like, and legs and a, a vague torso. Yeah, yeah. But Yogg-Sothoth is is described as a mass of writhing tentacles and a million eyes, just this floating ball of of, of black tendrils and tentacles, mm. and mm. it's just it's incomprehensive, and that's what makes it so scary. It's like if yeah, you don't, totally. if you don't know what you're looking at, it's like it could, it can drive you mad. It's because fear is sort of just like a badly framed lack of understanding. Yeah, that that's all fear of anything is. Like you hear a bump in the night and you're like, oh my god, what's that? Is someone coming in to, coming in to murder me? But no, it's just next door's cat <laughs> jumping onto the desk. Or, or do you know what I mean? It's it's fear is just. It's just a weird framing of things. By the way, I know we talk a lot about horror on this podcast, like we have done many times over. We have. The the horror trifecta was very strong in this film. It's a horrible thing happening in a horrible place for a horrible reason. Yes. And I think that that, that those are the three things you need. The horrible thing is the thing, and it's, it's the murder and we don't understand why, yep. happening in a horrible place, which is an Arctic research station, completely isolated from the rest of the world. You've got nobody's coming to help ever. Yep. 
and happening for a horrible reason, which is the thing is just we don't know. It's just doing it. We don't yeah. know why. It just yeah. it just keeps coming and we can't stop it. It's a lot scarier if it doesn't have any motive. Exactly, but yeah. The, the, the idea that, yeah, it's doing it because it, it just is and you don't know mm-hmm. why and you'll never know why. It's like, fucking hell, that's scary. That is, is. scary stuff. Um, <laughs> whew, uh, but I have I have another question and it's probably okay. the, the biggest question of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, who is the creature at the end of the film? Is it Mac or is it Childs? Oh, I think the fact that you don't know is what makes it. Do you know what I mean? The fact that it could be both of them well, and neither of them know as well. That, that's something that they, you don't really consider. Or the fact that it could just be neither of them, but they'll spend the rest of their life looking over their shoulder and going through rigorous decontamination at every possible opportunity. Well, to break the curtain a wee bit, um, John Carpenter, the director of the film, said that one of them is the thing. Ah, uh, okay. So he, he has confirmed that. So, mm. I need, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it a couple more times, and I think I'll 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 give my theory uh, mm. in the next podcast. <laughs> I think you're supposed to think that it's um, child, yeah. But there's no real reason you're supposed to think it's child, just because. No. Oh it's... yeah, you disappeared, and then you came. That's weird. But like, you and know. because and because Mac is like the sort of like protagonist, it's like we're, we're sort of biased, mm. Mm. which is which is another reason that it might be Mac. It's like, yeah. get get him on side and then we'll believe anything he says, which is something that the thing would do. Definitely, Ooh. definitely. <laughs> well, God. I think I have more or less run out of questions and notes. and So have I. I've got loads of stuff like, oh, that's cool, oh, that's cool, oh, that's interesting, I like that, but yeah, the only <laughs> things of value I've sort of got through them. Well, geez, oh, that was, that was the thing. Mm. What a classic, good what God. What an absolute classic. Um, Okay, well, closing statements. Uh, Yes, a chilling, gruesome tale of man's willingness to turn on each other in dire circumstances. The characters all behave sensibly and make the decisions they probably should, at least in their sound of mind. And yet the thing still comes. A classic in horror, sci-fi, cosmic horror, all of it. A classic and there's no denying it. Incorrect. I mean, correct. (laughs) I don't know why I said incorrect. (laughs) I'm all paranoid now. <laughs> um, an absolute breathtaking example of what cosmic horror is all about. The uncertainty, the paranoia, it gets me every single time. And I know I'm reiterating myself from the first opening statement, but I can't help repeating myself. It's such a great film, and I would recommend it to every single person on the planet. living, or, Living or dead. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, Cocker, now that I think we've finished, have we got some shilling to do? We do have some shilling to do, so let's let's do that. Um, no, let's do some shill. I am on Instagram at O'Hiram. Mm-hmm. I'm on Facebook at Daniel K. Actor. I'm on Twitter at Kerzo2000. What are you on, Lewis? I am on Instagram at Lewis underscore Brindley. I am on Twitter at Lewis Brindley4, and I am on a Facebook page called Lewis Brindley. Yes, excellent. I forgot um, the word for Facebook, but apart from that, that was a fantastic shill. <laughs> we're, we're hosted by uh, Podomatic. We're on uh, Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We have a YouTube channel. We're on Deezer. Uh, we have a PayPal donate button, so anything you can spare would be most grateful. I know it's a tough time at the moment. Indeed, indeed. Um, but, you know, anything would be would be fantastic. Uh, we have a Patreon, and we'd like to thank our two lovely patrons, Darius and Chloe. Thank you, guys. You are what makes this podcast keep going. Indeed you are. Thank you very, very much. Yes, and we are also partnered with a fantastic company called Number 12 Crochet Avenue. And this is Lewis's domain, as it always <laughs> is. So, Lewis, take it away, my friend. Uh, Number 12 Crochet Avenue is a company run by my spectacular, incredible, amazing wife. And I am going to keep putting another adjective on there forever. It's going to be an incredibly long list. That list will one day be longer than the actual podcast. But anyway, (laughs) um, it's a fantastic company run by my amazing wife where she crochets and she is incredibly good at it. I say it every time, but good grief, she's terrifyingly brilliant at it. Um, She's doing something at the minute, which I can't... Whenever she 
crochets i just can't help but watch it as it's like magic as this thing just forms out of thin air and also some yarn but mostly thin air and um she's got some new yarn she's hoping to do something cool with it soon um make sure you go and check her out at number 12 crochet avenue she takes submissions um and she takes commissions that's the word i was looking for um but yeah she's absolutely fantastic go and check her out the instagram is uh, i'm gonna do the same thing i did last time it's uh, uh that's it's kiss my fingers and then, and then throw the kiss into the air like a chef it's that go and check out the instagram it's fantastic she's at number 12 crochet avenue definitely definitely um there's a thing that i think we should probably do and we haven't we haven't really done it you did you talked about it last week um but i just want to personally i just want to say thank you uh, to to all the nhs key workers yes and and just anyone that, that's out working at the moment and I, I can only apologise for not for not saying it before. I clap every Thursday, okay? Okay, I love you all, and thank you so much for all your service. Indeed, you I, I I couldn't agree more. I'm I'm lucky enough to have some some members of the NHS in my in my family, and they're they're amazing people. The work that the NHS does is superb. I, I could not support the NHS more than I do. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you for doing this incredible frontline work. I I don't know how you do it. It's it's incredible. It certainly is, without a doubt. Um, well, thank you so much for listening. Indeed. Um, well, we have we have got to 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 tell them what we're doing next week, Lewis. We do. We said last week that we were going to do Carrie next week, but we realised that's a lot of horror all in one go, and we don't want to we don't want to terrify you guys a little bit too much. So instead, we are doing a film which is going to make Danny absolutely hate me. It is a Christmas themed rom-com it is the holiday starring loads of different people who i can't remember off the top of my head but it's really good genuinely i think there are good rom-coms there are bad rom-coms there are good christmas films there are bad christmas films and it's not christmas but we're gonna do this one because i like it it's dead good yeah we'll see Um, (laughs) if i don't if i don't kill you beforehand (laughs) i would not be surprised (laughs) yeah i'll give it a go but i'm not promising anything right (laughs) Um, thank you so much for listening uh, to the podcast Uh, we really enjoy doing this uh, and we shall see you hear you smell you lick you next week yes indeed we will thank you very much for listening (laughs) see you later